without discipline and self-control, you're never going to have what you say you want to have or be the person that you say you want to be. Let me give you an example you can relate to. Many of you said you were frustrated about the call on your life and your ministry, what you feel like God wants to use you for. And for you, it may even be business. It doesn't have to be something spiritual, but we all should have some kind of a dream and a vision and a goal, something we're stretching for in our life. Well, for me, I felt like God called me in to ministry and wanted to use me as a teacher. And everything was very little. And I don't do well with little. I like big, <laughs> splashy, dynamite. <laughs> I had to learn to get happy with little, but I didn't like it in the beginning. And so I was always praying for my ministry to grow, praying for my ministry to grow, praying for my ministry to grow. I was rebuking the devil and pounding on tables and praying, oh God, ah, I rebuke the devil. Well. In my daily life, God was really dealing with me about lots of things. One of them was my rebellious, sarcastic attitude toward my husband. <laughs> and for some of you men, it could be the way you treat your wives. Maybe you need to listen to her a little bit more. Maybe. Not sure. Maybe. Adam listened to Eve and look what had happened. <laughs> Abraham listened to Sarah and that caused a big mess too, so. But I'll just tell you my story. I had a sarcastic attitude that wouldn't quit. And it was almost impossible for me to do anything that I didn't want to do without saying something. <laughs> and even when I got to the point where I was pretending to be submissive, I would say, yes, honey. <laughs> and God had to tell me, submission is not an act you put on, it's an attitude of the heart. <laughs> so, you know, Dave's a good man, and I just wanted to make all the decisions, and I'd been mistreated when I was a kid, and so I had this real rebellious attitude, and I had kind of made an inner vow that once I got away from my dad, no man was ever going to tell me what to do again. And if you've made those kind of vows and promises to yourself, you better get started breaking them right now. Because like it or not, the Bible says that part of being obedient to Him is learning how to be submissively obedient to the authority that He's placed in your life. Well, you're not very happy about that, are you? And it's not about one person being smarter than the other or one person telling everybody what to do all the time. It's just about order. Things being done decently and in order. Now, I know some of you probably have got some real situations in your marriages, and I'm not trying to handle every situation here, but, you know, there was no reason for me to have the attitude that I had toward Dave. And I kept making excuses about it. Well, you know, I've been hurt. I mean, how, how long are we going to use the mess that happened when we were three? <laughs> no, it's time for us to take responsibility and say, okay, this happened to me and it hurt me and I wish it wouldn't have, but God's healing me and I can no longer use it as an excuse. Let God restore you, but don't stay in recovery your whole life.
and make everybody around you pay for what somebody else did 50 years ago. Ooh, this is better than I thought. Sometimes I preach better than I planned. Okay, so I'm praying for my ministry to grow. I rebuke you, Satan. God, I know you've called me to greater things. I pray, O oh Lord, that my ministry would grow. And I heard the Lord just so sweetly and softly say, Now, Joyce, I cannot do one other thing in your ministry until you do what I've told you to concerning your husband. Could we have multiple choice here, please, Lord? <laughs> I'd like to try another selection. <laughs> See, our flesh will do anything to try to squirm out of doing the hard thing. And you know, taking responsibility for things is sometimes very hard. To be able to say, it's not everybody else's fault that I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy because I've got a bad attitude. Hey, I want to compliment you guys. You are swallowing this good. <laughs> We're going to be able to have a big meal tonight because you're not spitting it out at me. So let me just say again, I was very frustrated back then about my ministry. And maybe, just maybe, may not be everybody, but maybe you're frustrated because things aren't moving along in your life, but maybe you're stuck somewhere it's something that God has asked you to do or not to do. You know, even sitting around feeling sorry for yourself is ungodly. <laughs> Can I tell you something? We've all got something we could feel sorry for ourselves about. I mean, I could sit up here tonight and tell you some stuff that's going on with me. And you would wonder how I even walked out here. I'm telling you the truth. And it's not always like that, but there's some intense things going on right now. But I have no reason to sit and feel sorry for myself, tempted. But I have to obey God and remember what He told me years ago, you can be pitiful or you can be powerful, but you can't be both. So I can't sit at home all afternoon. I can't do the morning session and then go to my hotel room and feel sorry for myself all afternoon and then come back here and expect to have a powerful word from God for you. God's got more for you. More, so much more in so many areas of your life. More peace, more joy, more power, more anointing, more blessing, more finances, more promotion, more favor. But another thing he has for you is more obedience. Come on, don't clap about the rest of it if you ain't going to clap about that. Many are called, few are chosen. I heard one man preach one time and say that actually what that really means is many are called, but few are willing to take the responsibility for the call. Because you know what? We want the perks without the works. Just like I said last night. And I'll tell you what my husband said. Dave likes to do little jingles, you know, and put little things together that rhyme. So we got in the car and he said, a person who wants the perks without the works is a jerk. <laughs> now Dave said that. I didn't say that. So if you want to write a letter, write it to him, not me. <laughs> God calls us to do amazing things. He offers us opportunity, but we must be prepared. Maybe there's a woman here tonight and you've already been married twice and divorced. You're waiting for God now to bring you the perfect man.
Well, you may not like the rest of what I'm going to say. I wouldn't get too excited yet. <laughs> but maybe you're not doing anything to get yourself prepared. Just, just maybe, maybe, maybe. One lady came to a pastor in St. Louis and she was getting married for the seventh time. And she said, I want you to pray that this man is going to treat me right. And he was bold. He said, has it ever occurred to you that the only common denominator in all of these marriages is you? Oh, yeah, I used to pray for Dave to change, so God told me I was the problem. <laughs> I'm making this stuff up. You wonder why I got so much to say? I've lived it. Many are called, few are chosen, few are willing to be responsible, few are willing to do the work, few are willing to discipline themselves, few are willing to walk in self-control. They want the perks without the works. Deuteronomy 6, 17. You shall diligently, how many of you know that diligently means keep it up and 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 keep it up. We've already had the keep it up sermon. If you missed it, I don't know what to say. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his exhortations and his statutes which he commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Now what is God saying? Do what I tell you to, so you can experience the good plan that I have for your life. If anybody here is tired of being miserable, then I want you to make a covenant with God if you will help me, God, if you will do it through me, I will commit to being promptly and extremely obedient. Now that means you've got to be obedient with your attitude. See, these are the things we don't consider. I, you know, I was going to church, but I was sitting home all week feeling sorry for myself. Hello? Well, so I still really wasn't being obedient. Just because you go to church and even if you tithe and you're an usher. I'm talking to you about what goes on at home behind closed doors. That's what I want to know about. You don't look for a spiritual person in church. We all wear our church face and get spiritual in church. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We get the little Holy Ghost jiggle. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I used to be silly enough to really think that those people say, like, ooh, the Holy Ghost. All that means is you better be careful, you're going to throw your back out of place. <laughs> Romans chapter 7, verse 6. <laughs> we got people crying out to Jesus over here. <laughs> Woo, Jesus! Now, you know, discipline is not intended to be a list of rules and regulations that you live by. It doesn't mean that to be disciplined, every moment of your day has to be planned up and you can never divert from that plan and you must do this at six and that at seven and you must do these certain things every day. I once was a very legalistic person and I had a rule about everything. We polished the floors every day. We dusted the furniture every day. We shined all the mirrors every day. And I was miserable and mean. <laughs> mm. 
My kids got their toys out, I'd tell them, go play. They'd get their toys out, and I'd say, clean this mess up. <laughs> anyway. I want you to understand that discipline and self-control is to be your friend. It's a tool for you to use, not a rigid legalistic law that you have to live by. To exercise, to discipline yourself to exercise doesn't mean that it has to become a law for you. And you never, never, never. What happens when things become a law for you and you become legalistic? The next thing that happens is you become very judgmental with other people who don't follow the law you have prescribed. Come on. So it's like I said this morning, we need balanced lives, and it means that we need to do a, enough of everything, but not too much of anything. And we need to be led by the Spirit. We're no longer obligated to follow a bunch of laws because Jesus took the law to the cross with Him. He fulfilled it. And we now have a new law to live by. And if you don't understand that discipline and self-control is not a bunch of rules and regulations and laws and is going to leave you with a very narrow little tiny life that makes you miserable, then you're not ever going to do it. Discipline is your ability to say no to yourself and yes to God. We're talking about disciplining ourselves to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about saying, Jesus, you're the standard. And no matter how I feel or what I think or what I want, if you will help me, I am willing to say no to myself and yes to you no matter how it feels. Because I know that even though no discipline for the present brings joy, nevertheless later on it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. <laughs> Wise people care more about later on than they do right now. Foolish people only care about how they feel right now and what they're getting right now. You got to care about later on. If you start saving a little bit of your money when you're 16, 17, 18 years old, and every time you get any kind of a paycheck, you save a little bit of that money and you don't use it for anything else, when you get to be my age, hey, you ain't going to have no worries. But people who spend everything they've got and then charge up the next six months' paychecks. Oh, well, you get it. <laughs> and you know, we live in a society that lives like that. And there's so much of it that we've almost accepted it as the way to live. But we can be disciplined and self-controlled and enjoy it it make us feel good about ourselves. I said this morning, I read in a book that people who are undisciplined usually are also full of self-loathing. They don't feel good about themselves. Because everywhere they look, there's an unfinished project or an incompleted commitment that we make. So now let's read Romans 7, 6. But now we are discharged from the law and we have terminated all intercourse with it. It means we have nothing to do with the law anymore. Having died to what once restrained us and held us captive. So now we serve not under obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the Spirit in newness of life. Did you get that? The law brought death. If you go home and make 25 new rules for yourself and all your family and say, we are now going to be disciplined and self-controlled, it's going to minister death to you. But if you'll leave here and say, God, if you'll help me, I want to learn how to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I want to learn to follow the little promptings, the still small voice. I didn't find a scripture that told me to put my grocery cart back in the little space marked off for grocery carts 25 years ago. But I talk about that a lot because that was a key thing in my life. 
It wasn't so much about the grocery cart as it was the principle. I wasn't being an excellent person by leaving a mess for somebody else to clean up. I only had a certain amount of money for groceries, and I couldn't go over it because we were extremely tight on money. And I would go into the grocery store, and sometimes by the time I got to the last aisle, I would realize that I had more than I could afford to pay for, and I had to start putting stuff back. But I didn't want to go put it back where I got it. Well, there's no scripture that says, yea, I say unto thee, when thy grocery shoppeth, <laughs> do not putteth the lettuce in with the cleanser. <laughs> That's not a scripture, but when I would take that extra head of lettuce out of my cart, and I'd think, oh, that's all the way over in the first aisle, and I'm all the way over here. Well, I'll just put it here. I didn't need a scripture for that. I had a new law working in my heart. Come on, I had a new law working in my heart. The promptings of the Holy Spirit were prompting me to be excellent. Because if you'll be excellent, then you can enjoy the excellence of God in your life. Come on. I was a big coupon clipper back then. And we ate a lot of chicken because we couldn't afford too much beef. And so I was always wanting to get chickens on sale when they were on sale at the store. And they'd put out these little coupons that said, limit three chickens per family, please. But I didn't want three chickens. I wanted a whole bunch. <laughs> three per family. But I'd get extra coupons and take my kids and have them all get carts. <laughs> now let me tell you something. I was teaching a home Bible study, but if I wouldn't have gotten beyond this stuff, that's still all I'd be doing. And I would have had my hand raised up tonight saying, I'm frustrated because my ministry is going nowhere. Uh-oh. Well, Joyce, if God would tell me to, I would give up everything and go to Africa. <laughs> But would you go put the lettuce back instead of leaving it with the cleanser? <laughs> That's what I think God wants to know tonight. Would you be willing to not park in a handicapped parking space because you ain't handicapped and you're just too lazy to walk? Now, I want to tell you the truth. I sense in my spirit that this is going to be absolutely life-changing for some of you. Now, how many of you have wanted a closer relationship with God? All right, well, let me tell you something. Making a commitment to live this way is the way you develop intimacy with God. Because it's no longer just a Sunday morning thing. But now you're going to invite God into every area of your life. <coughs> If you get dressed in the morning and the Holy Spirit says, uh, that's too low cut. Oh my gosh, I'm about to be bold. <laughs> you don't need to go to work with your top part hanging out. with a skirt so short that when you bend over, everybody sees the other part. <laughs> you need to dress and act like a woman of God. Yeah. 
And if we're not even that smart, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, it's not a law. Won't keep you out of heaven, but it's going to mess with your joy. It's going to mess with your peace. It's going to mess with your progress. You'll live with little the rest of your life. But God says, I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that you could ever dare to hope, ask, or think. Well, the key to having authority over Satan is to first submit yourself to God. And that requires a willingness to be obedient and to walk in self-control. When we submit ourselves to God, then we can resist the devil and he will have to flee. And it's really important that we don't get the two mixed up in the order that they need to go in. I think I spent a lot of years in my life trying to resist the devil, but I had not yet fully submitted to God. And I just really want to encourage you, if you feel like the enemy is really giving you a lot of trouble, you feel like that he's aggravating you and tormenting you all the time, that you do have authority over the enemy according to the Word of God, but you must first submit yourself to God. That's where your power is at, is in your submission to God. We're here at the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say they're therapeutic to the people here, yeah, right. and uh, the people are excited about what what has happened here. But we're excited about what God is doing, how He's helping the people here in Mangacha, Ethiopia. We have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing's for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say, I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that.